And here's a cross section, another, another important image that you'll encounter as you look at these companies, which shows you the third dimension, the, 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 how, how the body behaves underground. Now, the footprint. You've got to make footprint a core part of your vocabulary. Because really, the first question anybody asks when they look at an exploration play, even early stage ones, is uh, what's the upside potential? So you want to see how big is the alteration anomaly, how big is the geophysical anomaly, so that you can put to work that arithmetic you learned in elementary school. Because it is actually quite simple to guess or estimate the resource potential of a target. So, ore body arithmetic, very simple. Convert any target that you look at into some sort of rectangle. As everybody knows how to calculate the volume of a rectangle. Width times length times depth or thickness. Now, a very important concept in the resource sector is specific gravity. And is also a reason why you always use metric numbers when you are doing these estimates. So, specific gravity is the ratio by which a cubic meter of, of uh, any volume is more than a cubic meter of water. Now that's a technical detail you don't really need to remember. The important thing to remember is ask for what the specific gravity is and then multiply the volume that you have calculated for your, your, your resource estimate your, and, and that will be your tonnage. Now of course the gross metal value will be the rock value or the, uh, the average value per ton of rock times the total tonnage. And uh, I myself have, using Excel spreadsheet, put together a simple tool where I can plug in, plug in the various grades and, uh, and the prices for the commodities. And uh, whenever somebody produces a, uh, an intersection or a resource estimate, I plug these numbers into this little spreadsheet. Anybody with basic skills can do this themselves. And out pops this nice little number here showing what the rock value is. In this case, this is a random, random example of a polymetallic deposit with incredibly high, high rock value based on the sort of grades that this, uh, this particular uh, uh, set of assays represented. Now, what's a deposit worth? I mentioned earlier you can use the number of uh, gross metal value or in situ, in situ value, which is the, uh, the, the value of all the recoverable metals in the entire block, all looked at in one shot. Now, recovery is a very important concept also, because 100% recovery does not exist in the real world. There is always some loss, there's always some metal that you cannot get out. And some deposits have a peculiar mineralogy, perhaps they're refractory, where the recovery is very low, maybe only 40, 50 percent, or alternatively at enormous expense of energy and so on, you can get a higher recovery, but by that point your cost of recovering that metal is higher than what all that metal is worth in that ton of rock. Now, Another way of looking at the value of a project is to do the uh, total cash flow value over the life of the mine. So if you're going to make $50 million a year cash flow on a mine for 10 years, you can say, okay, this thing's going to have spin $500 million worth of cash flow. But that also is not a true value number because that $50 million payment 10 years from now is not worth $50 million today. So the discounted cash flow model, where you uh, discount these future streams of cash flow to the present, and from that present value, subtract the capital costs that you have to put up up front to make this mine a reality, that is your net present value. That is the true value of a deposit. And in this case here, what we have done as an example is Hammond Reef already has a resource estimate in place, 141 million tons of inferred material, 1.05 gram per ton, at $937 gold. Uh, that translates into 32 US per ton. And the total gross metal value of this deposit right now is $4.5 billion. But that's not 
what the project is worth or what the company is worth. This is just your starting point. And of course, with a number like this, in volatile markets, in particular with commodities such as gold, where there are some people saying, wow, we may have two, $3,000 gold as the new reality a couple years from now, you can do the math yourself and say, well, if gold went from roughly $900 to $2,000, this thing would increase to, to $10 billion of metal in the ground. So what I've done right now is simply give you a basic framework for quantifying the sort of upper limit for the value and then the means of working your way down. Now, here's the classic discounted cash flow formula. Uh, looks all gobbledygook and so on. Again, if you have a spreadsheet, uh, calculate, uh, Excel spreadsheet, you can use that NPV function and use the instructions to uh, create your series of cash flows and you can get a a true net present value for uh, any stream of cash flow that you can come up with for a mine. And again, very simple, How do you, what, what is cash flow? Well, it's revenue minus costs, very simple. Now, net present value formulae uh, can be very complicated and to make life simple for myself since we are doing back of the napkin calculations for basically what are educated fantasies. So I will do something like uh, take the, uh, the, the, the total uh, gross metal value in the ground, assume that we're going to mine it over 10 years, figure out what the approximate uh, costs are going to be, work out the cash, flow, uh, the cash flow per year, and then if you make it a 10-year mine life, there's a simple crude multiplier. If you want to apply a 20% discount rate, you multiply that annual cash flow by four. If you want to use 10%, multiply by six. And if you want to use a, use a 5%, which is very popular and probably not really justifiable in the real world, but it is a number used by the analytical community extensively, you multiply that uh, annual cash flow by eight. And that number, say it's, uh, it's gonna be $50 million cash flow uh, a year for 10 years. Uh, 8 times 50, 400 million, that's your present value. And if it's going to cost $200 million to put that in production, you yank that off, that 400 million, to have $200 million as your net present value. This gives you kind of a rough framework of what the upside potential is if this cycle goes through to fulfillment through all nine stages. Now, if you think... Uh, those were plenty of questions to worry about. Here are some more tricky questions, and the, the scope of this, uh, this session will, does not allow us to go into details, but just to make you aware. Other questions that you should be asking is, who is operating the project? Is it the company itself? Is it a major? Is it another junior? How does the agenda of that partner relate to the agenda of the junior in which you are considering making your investment? Um, when does the partner vest? Is your company contributing money right now? What sort of deadlines are in there? You will find this type of information in the notes to the financials or in a 43101 technical report where the company is required to spell out all these details. Uh, once you get really sophisticated about analyzing companies, you have to go and look at the terms of the agreement. There are a lot of project killer details, devils in the details. Another question you, got to ask the, you have to ask the companies, how are you funding this exploration cycle? Do you have money in place? Also, what is the timeline of the exploration cycle? Another important question is, are there title issues? Is there a dispute about the uh, ownership of the underlying claims? Are there geopolitical risk issues? We had a horrible situation like this in Ecuador where we had a world-class discovery several years ago and it was put in limbo when the government decided to suspend all the mining and exploration activity and, and rethink the uh, mining, mining Act. Are there local or aboriginal issues? I mentioned earlier in this case of Brett that this is in Canada. Well, in Canada there are certainly important uh, aboriginal issues and it, making sure that the company's actually dealing with the local aboriginal people and making sure they are part of the exploration cycle and keeping them abreast of what's going on. If that's not happening, guess what? 